folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We're going to go back to Matthew 24 after a month of putting out all the homecoming videos, which, by the way, I want to say thank you to everybody who attended homecoming this year. We met some brand new faces and new families, new people, and what a joy it was to meet all of them. Some of them we look forward to seeing every year, just couldn't make it. Okay, don't get me started on the COVID thing. Uh, but anyway, which is why a lot of people just couldn't be here because of the government restrictions being placed, which sort of goes into what we're going to talk about today. In Matthew chapter 24, uh, and, and by the way, again, thank you to Bethel Church all the people here who worked and uh, have worked together as a church for the past year to make Homecoming 2020 what it was. And we spent all August releasing those videos out to be the Watchman broadcast. Um, and yesterday on Pastor Mike Online, which would have been Tuesday, September the 1st, um, I talked about somebody I'm not a fan of. I don't like a lot of his doctrine. No, I just don't like the Bible he uses and some other things. But John MacArthur, he has a church out in Southern California in the Los Angeles area. And of course, his church being affected by COVID, the Democratic, liberal, extremist, communist, Marxist, Leninist, antichrist governor of California, Gavin Newsom, basically said, how dare you want to go to church? You can go to Walmart, you can go shopping, you can go to the park, you can go anywhere you want to. And oh, by the way, if you go to Walmart and you wear a mask, you can sing. You can sing in every aisle, it's probably more so in the liquor aisle, but anyway, you can sing in whatever aisle you want to at Walmart with a mask on, but you can't go to church and sing with a mask on. Now, what's the difference? Gav, there isn't one. It's obvious. It is obvious in the eyes of everybody who actually has eyes and can see what this is. This is an attack. It's a political thing, number one. Number two, it's an attack on Christianity. Now, again, MacArthur and I have lots of differences. Okay. Well, I wouldn't say lot. It's, it's not like the differences between me and, let's say, the Pope. Um, but the liberal enemies that are in California don't know that difference. To them, churches are not necessary. They're not vital. They don't believe in God anyway. And so we're all, we're all a bunch of right-wing Trump supporting extremists anyway. So let's just make life a living hell on earth for those people, okay? That's their approach. So they're going after all the churches in California and probably other states as well, and especially the ones who defy the order, saying we're going to charge you $10,000, we're going to freeze your bank accounts, we're going to put armed policemen in front of your church, and we're going to do... All because then we find out the CDC, and MacArthur mentioned this, CDC said, you know that 190,000 people that died of COVID? It wasn't really 190,000. It, it was more like, it's a little less than that. It's like nine, 9,000. Because if you reduce the comorbidity, took me a while to practice that word, if you reduce that, in other words, a guy goes into the ER, has been shot 14 times in a gang-related shooting. He's bleeding out everywhere. And as he's dying, they scoop up some of that blood, they send it to the lab, and they find out he's tested positive for COVID. Died of COVID. That's what they did. Okay? So then when they fixed the numbers back, a little over 9,000 people actually died of COVID. Now, my heart goes out to those families. It's a real disease, okay? So I'm not making light of that, but we're angry. 
to shut down the entire country, and they're still doing it. State of Illinois, today, enacting more restrictions, not less, on restaurants, saying restaurants now can no longer have nobody inside a restaurant. You cannot be inside of a restaurant. You want food, you either get it to go or eat it outside, but don't you dare go in there. And all kinds of ridiculous, ridiculous things like that. College campuses, schools being affected, everything being affected. Guys out, guys out in 98 degree heat, 98% humidity, football practice in August, wearing masks. Does that make sense? No, okay? But especially I'm focusing on the church related issues because this week in Matthew 24 in our study, we'll get into the scriptures, we're going to find out that there's persecution on its way. So let's pick it up. Oh, let's go to sort of the meat of all of this where Jesus really, they asked him, you know, what are the signs of that coming? I won't go back into all that. Got too much ahead of us to look at, so we won't look behind much. But let's pick it up in verse 4 of Matthew 24. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Now, all these are the beginning of sorrow. So we have dealt with all of that um, in the previous episodes. And, uh, you know, maybe there's some more about this that we can cover as we go along. But I want to get in focus on what we're talking about today, starting in verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Now, again, I'm not going to apologize for what I'm about to say or share uh, I know that there are many people who have a disagreement with what I'm going to say. S some of the arguments I can sort of go along with. Some of them are just, I guess, ridiculous. But they, there's so many different opinions about what is going to happen in the future. And so, I've take, again, I've taken their approach. Let me just throw out all the charts and the maps that I used to see and all the timelines that everybody drew up, and let's just go with what the scriptures are actually telling us. Now, does it sound appealing for us to say as ministers of the gospel that our future definitely includes people being slaughtered for the cause of Jesus Christ and his gospel. No, that doesn't make you very popular, and people, do, you'll not see that in a Joel Osteen book anytime soon. Guarantee you that, okay? But that is the message of Christianity. That a Christianity, if it's a faith worth living for, it's a faith worth dying for. And I don't know about you, I've made up my mind that I want to go to heaven I'm going to die anyway. So if I get a choice of either dying some meaningless, worthless, senseless death or dying serving my God and his kingdom, I will choose to die serving my God and his kingdom. I'm going to die anyway. I'm not looking forward to it except for the heaven part. That part I'm looking forward to, but the dying part, it's not so much that I'd close my eyes and wake up in heaven one day. It's like, is this going to hurt? That's me, right? Okay, but he says here, they shall deliver you up to be afflicted. These are, this is some of the signs that they asked Jesus. Jesus, tell us, 
you said this temple is going to be destroyed. Three days you're going to rebuild it. What's going to be the sign of this and of that coming and of the end of the world, the end of the age, probably, end of this time and going into the next one? What's going to be the sign of that? So he's talking about the famines, the rumors of wars, the, er the earthquakes, pestilences. Did I say famines? Famines. He's talking about all that, and then he said, they'll kill you. And again, my earlier, as a young man, a young boy, a young teenager, telling me I'm going to be killed because I want to go to heaven when I die, I'm going to be shot down by some evil Antichrist Empire army. I don't want that. So I believe I'll be raptured first. It was just convenient for me to say that. Now that I'm definitely older, a little bit wiser, not much, but one thing about me is I love my Lord. I love my God. I love His Word. I love His kingdom, and I love what He's done for me. And He says I don't owe Him a debt, but I'm living like I owe Him a debt. That's how I'm living. That's how I want to see it in my mind, is that every day I'm working and laboring to try to undo the things that I, you, we all did in the past. That's how I see my future coming. So let me keep reading. Verse 10, then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now again, I just believe that. I believe what it says, how it says it, and I believe it's going to happen exactly that way. Now, um, he mentions here, iniquity, because iniquity, iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. You think about that statement right there in relation to the world that we're living right in right now, okay? The Antifa people, the terrorists, the homespun, homegrown, left-wing, communist, Marxist, Nazi terrorist. are they all Bible-believing church going Christian people? Do they have prayer meetings on Wednesday? Do they all hold hands and have prayer before they go out and, you know, beat people up and burn buildings down, terrorize whole communities? Do they do that? No. What's turned them so, so against their, they're saying, we hate America, destroy America. You live here. You live in this country. You are, you have enjoyed the prosperity and the blessings that this nation has provided all your life. And now you want to tear it down? What makes a person think that way? The abundance of sin. Because see, with the abundance of sin, that creates an environment. Go back and watch several versions I've done and talked about this over the years where dragons live. Dragons are devil spirits. And you want to see a house that's built specifically for dragons to dwell in? It's a house full of sin. It's a life full of iniquity. And because that iniquity abounds, the love of many shall, uh, shall wax cold. They will kill and already have. We're dealing with someone who was wearing, I guess, a Trump hat or a Trump shirt went into an area, bam, bam, shot him twice and killed him dead for his political views because they hated his political view so bad, according to them, he had no right to live. So they took him out. And it wasn't like, you know, well, he raped my sister and I'm going to kill him. It wasn't like anything like that at all. Maybe you could say, well, I could kind of see their point. But no, he's wearing a Trump hat. 
And they said, well, we can't kill Trump. We'll kill him instead. And you know what? And, and, and if I'm out of line on this statement, I'll retract it. But do you believe that if the Antifa people could, if they were given a, a license by Kamala Harris, go out, find everybody that's a Trump supporter and kill them dead. And we'll let you all scot-free. You think they'd do it? In a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. Okay? So that's, th that's this coming to pass. This Bible is right. God knows the minds and the wicked nature of people. And anytime sin is rampant, they don't just hate church and won't go to it. They hate church people and people who go to church and people who pray and people who read the Bible and people who have morality about them. They hate them and believe that they don't have a right to exist on this planet. Okay? So, yes, these things are definitely coming to pass. Let's look at the parallel passages as we do in this study. We're not just restricting to Matthew 24. We're going to look at the synoptic Gospels, Mark and Luke as well. Here's Mark's version of that. Mark 13, verse 9. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues you shall be beaten. Again, it just doesn't sound like something I want to wake up and say, honey, let's go to the synagogue and let them beat us up. You want to do that for Sweetie Pie Day? I don't want that. They shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues you shall be beaten. You should be brought before rulers and kings for my sake for a testimony against them. The gospel must first be published among all nations. That is very important. Very important to what this persecution is really all about to begin with. Verse 11, but when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate. But whatsoever shall be given you that in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. And I actually have, you know me, I actually have a picture of that. It's in our Bible. I'm going to show it to you in a little bit. Let's look at Luke 21, the, the other parallel passage, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. And there's some other things scattered in Mark and Luke that match Matthew 24. But here's Luke 21, verse 12. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you. Stop right here. Get the Pure Bible Search software. Type in the letters P-E-R-S-E-C-U-T, asterisk. And just study every place in the Bible where it mentions persecution. Just study that, just for your own knowledge, okay? Now, again, it, you, you can still, I would, would say that if you want to hold to what is traditionally referred to as a pre-trib rapture and still believe that there is persecution coming prior to us being translated because... Let's be fair. The idea that Christians don't get persecuted is a uniquely American idea. Or I would say Western Hemisphere, any of the English-speaking nations where Christianity has abounded for the last several hundred years. But in many other places in the world, if you say, well, bless God, we get raptured before any persecution happens to us, they'll say, I lost my uncle last week to a group of Muslims who came in our village and just killed him because he was a pastor. It's already happening in a lot of places around the world and has been ever since Jesus left and the Holy Ghost was poured out. It's been happening already. All right? But study the word persecution. 
Before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what you shall answer. There's your double witness. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And ye shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends. And some of you they shall cause to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. Now look at this. He says on one hand, they're going to beat you and kill you. But then he says, but there shall not an hair of your head perish. So, they're going to kill me, but at least I'll get to keep my hair. Is that what you're saying? Remember something that Jesus told us. Don't fear the one who can kill the body only. Fear the one who can kill both the body and the soul. So, again, you're going to die. Something's going to kill every one of us. But to die for the cause and the sake of Jesus Christ, according to scriptures, there is no greater honor anywhere. There is no greater honor. When Peter and John and James were persecuted for preaching the gospel in the early days of the book of Acts, they were brought into this, the council, the Sanhedrin, the 70 judges that Moses had set up. And they were judged and they said, We tell thee, thou shalt not speak in this name of Jesus any further longer ever againeth. And they said, Well, we ought to obey God rather than men. So they beat him. They said, Now go and get out of here and don't be preaching that Jesus stuff anymore. And they walked away rejoicing that they were counted worthy be persecuted and beaten for the sake of Jesus Christ. And the purpose of that persecution, you read 1 Peter, it's twofold. Number one, if you're being beat on by an angry mob, you just not don't have the tendency to, you know, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life type thing. It just don't really show up in a badly beaten body. But number two, Remember why we're here to begin with. It's not to just soak up all the sun's rays and breathe all of God's air and enjoy the good life. It's to preach the gospel. That, that doesn't just fall on the preachers. Who was the first martyr? Stephen. And what was he? Was he an apostle? No. Was he a bishop? No. He was just a deacon. And they killed him. Okay? So it's not just the pulpit guys that are going to get it. It's the people sitting in the pews too. But God's going to use that. And you know, we've, we've always said, we've sounded so spiritual saying, I'd give, brother, I would give anything if, if my children would start serving God again. I would do anything if my husband would get right with God. I would do anything if my wife would start serving Jesus. Really? Do you, if you really mean that, would you give your life for it? Would you let somebody merciless, mercilessly, would you let a guy just beat on you without mercy? If it meant that somebody's heart would soften and they would turn to Jesus? Because that's the purpose of the coming persecution. And it is so that we preach the word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ, one last time before we're taken to be with Jesus forever. Okay? So there's your three gospels 
all of them saying the exact same thing in slightly different ways, but all of them say they're going to persecute you, they're going to hate you. And they're not going to just hate you because of your skin color or what your family's name is, your income bracket, what country you came from. They're going to hate you because you love Jesus and you've taken the name of Jesus. You are a Christian and they are going to hate you for that reason alone. And they will persecute you for that. And some of you, not all of you, some of you they will kill. But God's going to preserve you. Well, wait a minute. If God preserves us, are they still going to kill us? Yeah. Again, we're going to lose this body no matter what. Everybody that I've known that's lived before me that's already died, they lost this body. But they're getting a new one. And so will we. So I mentioned to you these three passages here. And Jesus said they're going to take you up before councils, and they're going to take you to synagogues, and they're going to question you. Don't, don't premeditate it. Don't think about what you're going to say. Don't, don't write the script down. Just go, and I'll give you the words to say. And I promise you, when those words come out of your mouth, they won't be able to argue with anything you say. Now, they'll still kill you they won't be able to argue with you. And we actually have a picture of that in our Bibles. And I mentioned Stephen, who wasn't an apostle, wasn't even a bishop. He was just a deacon. You know, we go to Acts chapter 6, you know the purpose of the office of the deacon. You know, everybody's got a place, a role that they fill in, in the kingdom of God. And it's just like the body, the comely parts, the parts that look good, well, they're probably the most useless things that we have on our body. You know, an ugly guy has a nose and a mouth and ears and eyes, and the fact that he's ugly doesn't keep him from hearing, smelling, tasting, or seeing, or breathing. You see what I mean? So somebody looking nice and somebody being in the front of everybody, that doesn't mean he's the most qualified and the best of all of God's people. It could be the very least of the brethren that God uses. And so here we have, you know, there was, a, there was an issue with the apostles and the daily ministration. They were giving out food, you know, like we're supposed to. And they were complaining that some were getting served and not others. And, you know, the apostles were going, look, we, we can't, we're trying to spend time in the Word of God so we can preach the sermons and teach the doctrine. And these people do need to be fed. It is not meet that we should lead the Word of God and go serve tables. It wasn't that, that they were lazy or that they were exalting their high office. We're the uh, godly men who cannot be bothered with you poor people. It wasn't that at all. That's what some people turn it into, but that's not what it was about. It's about, le this, we have to spend time with the Word of God. Can we have some guys help us out in that and go serve these people? God sent us a family here in this church, and I'm not saying anything against any other families in this church, but God sent them here, and after a while, God laid it on my heart this man, I want him to be your deacon. And our church approved it, I mean, unanimously. And his primary role here is to help serve our widows. And if you just ask any of our widows, they'll tell you, hey, love him. He does a tremendous job for them. He's mowing their grass. He's fixing their toilet. He's, you know, fixing the leak in their sink, and he's just there to talk to them. God bless him for that, okay? So that's what Stephen was. So that was why they developed the office of deacon. The deacons, by the way, are not the board that governs the church and tells the pastor what he can and cannot do. That's not what they're for, okay? They're there as a help and a ministry inside the local body of believers. And the good ones, they do it right. 
okay? And I've got two good ones here. I don't have two bad ones. I just have two. They're the best. So here's Stephen, Acts chapter 6. And we're going to read this, a lot of this chapter, but we're going to get the context of what happens here, Acts chapter 6 and Acts chapter 7, of exactly what Jesus said. So let's start out in Acts chapter 6, verse 5, and look at this martyr, the first one. He's our example. He's our example. In verse 5, the saying pleased the whole multitude. This is when they announced, okay, we're going to have deacons. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. And a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. He wasn't an apostle. He wasn't a bishop. He was a guy that handed out food to people. But he was a godly man. He believed the Bible. And God came over him and filled him with wisdom and blessing. And all of a sudden, Stephen, he was probably ministering to some old woman. Stephen, pray for me. I just feel awful today. Stephen laid his hands on her, prayed for her. Boom, she's healed. Wow, amazing. Right? And I want you to notice, Stephen's first name on the list here. He's first name. And there's just something about Stephen that just stood out. But I will tell you, those that stand out in the kingdom of God, they're always going to be the first targets. Always. You pray for those who lead you in, this, in your walk of Christ, whether it's a godly husband, a godly wife who's your help meet, helping you to keep on the straight and narrow, children who have godly parents who are leading them to Jesus, pastors, deacons, whoever, you pray for them. They're on the front line. And the devil knows if he can get to them and destroy them, that he can go after everybody that they're protecting after that. So, here's what happened. Verse 9. Then there arose a certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and the Cyrenians, and the Alexandrians, and of them Cilicia, and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And I want you to notice there's five groups here. Synagogue of the Libertines, the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. Now, just hold on to that thought for a minute. Five groups here. And if you already know a little bit about the number five, you know kind of what it means. So watch. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Boom, look at that. Did you see what I just read? That's exactly what Jesus said. If you will let me speak through you, they won't be able to resist it. They won't be able to argue. They won't be able to say, ah, according to Isaiah chapter 53, you're wrong. They won't be able to do that. And they couldn't. They couldn't conquer Stephen. They couldn't control him. They couldn't buy him out. So they said, we'll kill him. So verse 11, then they suborned men, which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council, and set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against his holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And they all sat in the council looking steadfastly on him. Look at, look at this verse. Saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. You remember the, the show Touched by an Angel? And then what was it? Michael Landon, Stairway to Heaven. I'm an angel sent from God. 
And you know how her, like the, they would do the camera thing with the lighting and all of a sudden her face would light up. I'm an angel from God. Remember that? that that's what happened to Stephen. He was just a guy. He was just a man. The Bible even says of Elijah, man of like passions. So Stephen, just a sinner saved by grace. And yet, he's taken before the council. They hate his guts. And they accuse him of all these false things that they accuse us of. Remember what, remember what the Beatitudes said? Blessed are they. We're going to read those in a minute. Remember what 1 Peter said? Blessed are you when they persecute you for doing what's right and for the word's sake. It's better for you to be persecuted when you've done nothing wrong than for you to be persecuted when you did everything wrong. So that's why they're going after Stephen. They can't shut him up. They can't prove how wrong he is. So they had to lie about him to have the counsel. But when they looked on him, it looked like they were looking at an angel. His face. Now, think about this. When we die, when we're resurrected, with what body will we have? The body of Christ. And Jesus said we will be as who? The angels. So in the translation, when we're changed, resurrected, those who are dead already, and transformed and caught up, we're going to be as the angels in heaven. And here, Stephen, they're just getting a glimpse of his very near future. Because we know in chapter 7, I'm not going to read all of chapter 7, chapter 7 is beautiful. It, I said this the other day, it condenses the entire Old Testament down into just a few verses. And everything about it was targeted right at those people who brought him to that council. And Stephen wasn't saying, you know, we all serve the same God, just different names, different doctrines. Why don't we try to find common ground and we can work together? Is that what he said? No. He let those boneheads have it. He told them, he gave them what for. He told them, he said, you guys, first of all, your fathers killed all the prophets that God sent, and you're not no better than they are. You killed Jesus, the Son of the Most High God. You killed him because you were afraid that he was going to take all your religious power away from you. That's why you killed him. Love of money and love of power. Love of money is the root of all evil. And they were scared to death of Jesus. That's why they killed him, and they didn't like Stephen for the same reason. In fact, Stephen here is going to be Christ-like, because what did Jesus say when he's dying on the cross? What did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What did Stephen say as they are literally bashing his brains out with huge stones? Lay not this sin to their charge. So let's pick it up in verse 51 of chapter 7. Peter, uh, Stephen saying, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. N now, he's already taught them that they killed Jesus. So, yeah, in a way, he's told them the gospel. He told them it through all the typology of the Old Testament. How that, like Moses, Moses thought he was going to do your people a favor. And he saw, you know, the Egyptians being uh, mean to an Israelite. So Moses went and killed the Egyptian. And Moses thought that the Jews would say, Moses, thank you for doing that for us, for standing up for us. But they said, what, are you going to kill us too? Get out of here. And Moses had to leave his own people. And that's how Jesus is. Jesus is like, fine, I'm not going to talk to you Jews ever again. I'll just go to the Gentiles. They'll worship me. And I mean, Stephen is letting them have it. 
He's not compromising one bit. And he's not trying to save his skin. He's not telling them what he thinks they want to hear so he can live longer. Calls them stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart, and it's true. So verse 52, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God, Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Woo! Can you imagine that? And, and again, there's so much of Jesus and Stephen that he's literally reliving the life of Christ and the death of Christ right here. Remember how the Bible says Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and he sees the cross. He knows that he's going to be uh, scourged. He knows he's going to be beaten. They're going to pluck his beard out with their fingernails. They're going to blindfold him and hit him and say, who hit you? They're going to spit on him. They're going to put a cross on him. They're going to nail him to that cross, and they're going to watch him slowly over the course of, what, six hours? Uh, just slowly suffocate to death. Horrible death. Horrible, horrible death. And yet Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is looking around that to the glory that was awaiting him on the other side. It's like, yeah, let's hurry up and get this cross thing over with. I want to go be with my father. And that's Stephen. Stephen knows that he's going to get stoned. He knows they're going to take big rocks and beat him to death with them. But he's not looking at that. He's looking around that at the glory that awaits him when he stands before God. My friends, that's how we're going to get through this. That, that's how we already got through our persecutions. Anytime devils came after us or people, you look beyond what they're going to do to you and look at the glory on the other side. You know, got to where my right arm, my right shoulder, it hurt so bad and it got to where I couldn't even hardly play the piano anymore. And I finally said, I gotta, I gotta have this taken care of. Now, on the day of my shoulder surgery, back all those years ago, I was not the same person. I did not want to go through that. But I thought, if it works, if it helps, it'll be worth it. And it took six months, but it was worth it. I'm glad I did it. And it's going to be that same way. We're not going to get to heaven and you're going, what, is this all there is? It's like a cheap amusement park. <laughs> and I got killed for this? It's not going to be that, that way. We're going to see Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father. In fact, we're going to meet him in the air. And if we will look beyond our persecutions and our trials to that, We'll be okay. So, verse 56, he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. We know who that is. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus Receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, I like how this says that. It doesn't say that, you know, when he had said this, you know, Lord, 
um, lay not this into their charge, and a stone crashed into his face and killed him. Didn't say that. He said he just fell asleep. I don't know, maybe God delivered his soul out before the physical part of it got to, I don't know. I don't know. But I know that any amount of suffering that we go through is not anything that our Savior didn't go through as well. He endured it simply because, well, with Christ, you know, we are, he did have a choice, but he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And it may come to a point where you and I don't really have a choice. And remember, we're going to die anyway. Why not die for the Lord Jesus? Not saying you will. Some obviously won't. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. But Stephen was that example of exactly what Jesus said. They're going to take you to the synagogues. They're take you before councils. You'll stand before kings. Don't think about what you're going to say. I'll give you the words. They won't be able to resist it. They will kill some of you. Okay? Don't let that eat you up. Don't let that worry you. Don't let that bother you. Just follow me. Okay? Um... Let's go to Luke chapter 10, because rather than focusing on how bad all of this is going to be, let's focus on what's really important. Luke chapter 10, verse 18, he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. This is Jesus. Behold, I give unto you power, look at this, to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And again, I'm going to give you examples of this. Now, scorpions and serpents are not something that I go around looking to pick up. I'm not the crocodile guy. Crikey, he's a big one. Ooh, look at this one. Ooh, one bite from him. I'll die within a matter of hours. I don't do that. That's not me. Hey, I don't care what kind of snake. Oh, those snakes won't hurt you. Oh, I don't care. Oh, them are dirt daubers. They don't sting you. I don't care. I stay away from them. That's me. Okay, you tell me a way to avoid pain. That's the route I'm taking. But I got a promise from my Savior, my Lord, my God, that if I'm attacked by serpents and scorpions, that God won't let them have power over me. Again, I'm, I've already been hurt in this body to the point of almost dying. So I can't sit here and tell you, oh, you won't feel anything. God won't let us feel any pain when those days come, because that's not true. I mean, I feel pain today over it. That was 14, 15 years ago, okay? But he says, nothing shall by any means hurt you. So I would say more than likely that has to do with the hurting of the soul not necessarily the flesh. Goes back to what we said earlier. Jesus told us, don't be afraid of the one who can kill the body. Be afraid of the one who can kill both soul and body in the judgment. And then he says, you know, when these scorpions and serpents attack you and they don't hurt you, don't rejoice in that, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. And who wrote it there? It wasn't you. It was God, your Father, wrote your name down. Mark chapter 16, verse 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, and they shall speak with new tongues, and they shall take up serpents. And if they drink 
any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, I don't believe that this means that we can go around picking up snakes and scorpions and saying, God said it wouldn't hurt me, like they do in some rattlesnake churches in the hills of East Tennessee and Kentucky. I don't believe that. I don't believe you ought to go around drinking deadly poison. But think about all the, the scare, the fear that's on the internet about all the genetically modified food and the vaccines that they got coming. They're going to roll out vaccines and these are all going to be the mark of the beast and they're going to kill everybody. And this is a, you know, don't worry about catching some COVID virus. I would worry about the vaccine they're going to give because that's what's going to kill everybody. They want everybody dead. And it's got God's people scared to death that somehow, some way, they're going to get the mark of the beast and not know it. Number one, that's not possible. Jesus already said, if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. But it's not possible. Number two, so let's say that they did devise secretly some genetically modified Snickers bar. I like Snickers bar. I like Butterfinger better now. So let's say they genetically modified all the Butterfinger candy bars in the world that when you eat them, it turns your DNA into that of a dog. And they are, they're doing that to, for, to control everybody. Well, Jesus said, so if you eat that, not knowing that that's there, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. One thing I was told years ago, Mike, they can't take away your birthday. You'll always have that. And they can't take away your second birth, people. They can't. And the way I hear some people talk, it's almost like they've linked their first birth with their second, like, man, if I let any of this GMO in me accidentally, or I let this, or I, let, I breathe this air, or whatever, I'm going to lose my salvation. Don't believe that. And I know websites, I named them for you right now, that will tell you that, and I'm telling you, don't believe it. Jesus made a promise to us that the, all the power of the enemy would not be able to kill our soul. And that's what I'm seeking to protect. Not my physical life. Again, I'm going to say it. I'm going to continue to say it through this video. You are going to die anyway. And it doesn't matter. Is there a way from the Bible? Is there anything in the Bible mentioned in scriptures anywhere that if you die a certain way, you're, you lose your salvation? Is it anywhere in here? No. God does not hinge your everlasting salvation to the condition of your body and why it died. Never anywhere in here is it. But the way some of these websites talk, oh my goodness, if you're eating that, you're, you're going to lose your salvation. Don't believe it, people. Don't do it. Okay? So we got two places in the Bible telling us, Luke 10, Mark 16, telling us, don't fear these people. Don't fear their... Because what's, the, what's all this... I mean, we're all like pretty much on the same side on the COVID thing, right? It's a pandemic. I get it. I do. And I don't think that right now it's because they have the mark of the beast ready in a COVID vaccine. I don't believe that. I believe it's for other reasons, and I won't get into them in this video. But I believe that it was planned out to bring something else in that will lead to something else that will lead to something else. Eventually, we're going to get to the mark of the beast. But everybody's afraid right now, and you've got promises in the Bible where Jesus said, 
Don't let that scare you. Don't let it worry you. Don't let it bother you. Revelation 9. You know, the thing where he said about the scorpions. I shall give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. Think of the, the word that he used here, tread. Tread you do with your feet. Okay? Unless you are really good at walking on your hands, of which I'm not. He said, I will give you power to tread. Now, think of uh, Revelation, uh, Romans, Romans 16. May the God of heaven bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Ten toes, ten's a number for dominion. Anything that's under our feet, like Joshua telling his captains, go stand on the necks of these five. Remember what they, who came against Stephen? Five. These five kings. And he tells them to go stand on the necks of the five kings of the, uh, I think it was what, the Philistines? King of Jerusalem, King of Eglon. And he said, thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom you fight. Be not, be not afraid. Don't be afraid of them. God's going to let you conquer all of those enemies. Every one of them. So I'm going to give you power to tread on scorpions and serpents. May the God of heaven bruise Satan under your feet shortly. So Revelation chapter 9, here's the scorpions. It's not just little desert things with stings in them. These are different. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented. How long? Five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Now, in this, and we've covered this many times, everybody else on the whole earth who gets stung by these things, they want to die, but death is going to be taken from them, and they're going to be in absolute torment for five months. But what happens to the people who are sealed? with that Holy Spirit of promise. They don't even sting them. And what sting is it? What is it in the Bible that stings? Death. And it does, doesn't it? When you lose somebody precious to you, man, that stings. It hurts. It hurts bad. Okay? You got pierced, you got pricked, you got stung by death. But in this case, for five months, those locusts come out. Fifth trumpet, there's a pattern here. I'm setting you up for a number. The fifth trumpet sounds, that's important. The star falls from heaven. I think that's Lucifer, son of the morning. How art thou fallen into the... Uh, how thou cut down to the ground, how thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. And here he is falling out of heaven. To him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Is it because they fought and Satan won? Aha, I got the key. No, it was given. Here you go. You want that key? You know what to do with it. Satan's like, you just gave me the key of the pit. Jesus, yeah, I know. Well, I'm going to go open it. Don't you stop me. Okay, no, I'm not going to stop you. Go ahead. Okay, it was for a reason. And when these scorpions come out, if you and I are here, which I think so, what's God going to give us the power to do? Tread on them. They won't have 
dominion over us. We, because of Christ, will have dominion over them. Then, Acts chapter 28. I love this story. Because remember, Paul and his group were shipwrecked, and they floated, and they thought they were all going to die, and Paul said, God's told us we're not going to die. Guys, just hang in there. So they floated for a while. They finally landed on this island, and the people on the island, they're going to build a fire, so everybody's gathering sticks, and Paul gathered a bundle of sticks. Let's read it. Acts 28, verse 1. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita, and the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. I would be like, ah, I got a stake on my hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. They're like, man, karma stinks, doesn't it? I don't believe in karma. They did. So in verse 5, in verse what? He shook off the beast into the fire. Do you know, this is the first time in the New Testament that the phrase, the beast, is mentioned. And you remember how many times it's mentioned overall in the New Testament? Thirty-three times. And you know what happens the 33rd time the beast is mentioned? It's cast into the lake of fire. Paul shook off the beast, not the serpent, the beast into the fire. And then, and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after that, they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him. They changed their minds and said that he was a god. Now, of course, Paul's going, uh, we're not going there, people. I'm not a god. But he used that... Do you think Paul was like, well, I don't know why that happened. You ain't one of them Christians, are you, Paul? Well, I mean, I, yeah, I kind of am. Do you think Paul was like that? No. He preached to those people. I mean, think about it. Did God want the people on that island who were a barbarian race of men, very primitive, the fact that they didn't just kill these people and eat them tells you something. God wanted Paul on that island, and it certainly was a strange way to get him there, but he got him there, and now those people are going to get to hear the gospel that God, their creator, loves them, and that Jesus died for their sins. Maybe, just maybe, we'll meet some of those people in heaven when we get there. We can ask them that story. Tell us what you saw there. We, we, we always read the story. We want, to, we want to hear how it happened. Well, it happened the way the Bible said. Okay? But it just keeps adding up here that everything the Bible's told you so far about this persecution that's coming, how it, it's going to be bad. Some people are going to get killed. Don't worry. Death is going to happen to us all. Got to die some way. Or maybe some will be blessed enough to have not tasted death. We'll just be changed, then taken into heaven in the moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. And I believe that. But either way, we're going to go to heaven when that happens. I worry about the pain of death. I'm not big on pain. So I kind of thought, you know, maybe a nuclear explosion would be the best way to go. Because, I mean, literally, you are vaporized before the nerve impulses in your body would have a chance to register to your brain that you're under intense heat. You would just be vaporized and not know of your own demise. You'd never know what hit you. Never. That would be 
how I would want to go or like in my sleep, right? But maybe it's not going to happen that way. But however it happens, God's people, we're going to be okay. We're going to be just fine. There is a glory awaiting us on the other side of our cross. And our death is our cross. It's our crucifixion. That's when we finally lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. And now we're ready to be with Jesus for all of eternity and suffer no more. If you notice in Revelation 6, there's another connection with this number five. You have the fifth trumpet, five-month thing that happens with the scorpions and the treading on them. And we go back and look at verse 5 in Acts chapter 28, and that's when Paul shook the beast off into the fire. See, it happened exactly the way Jesus said. It had no effect on him. What's it? I mean, they were waiting for him to die. He's going to swell up and die. But it didn't happen. So Jesus was right in everything that he said in this number, and there's another number fixing to show up here in a little bit, that's sort of giving us an idea of how it's all going to happen. Because I believe God's not going to leave anything out. He's going to give us great patience and comfort of scriptures to endure through these days. And it won't be long. Not when you compare it to the eternity that some people are going to face in the lake of fire. But notice what's said, you know, that was the fifth trumpet where the scorpions come out. If we go back to the seals, what happens when the fifth seal is opened? Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now, this is not slain in the Spirit. This is not that. These are people that have been killed because they believed and read the Bible, and they lived it, and the devil hated them. Just like Jezebel hating Naboth because of his vineyard, and he believed what God said, I can't sell the vineyard and I'm not going to give it away to anybody, especially to Ahab. That's you telling the devil, you can't have my soul. This is mine. I'm not, giving it to, I'm not giving my soul to anybody. Jezebel says, well, I'll kill you if it's the last thing I do, but I'm going to take that. You can kill me all you want to. You can kill me twice if you want to. But you're not getting my soul. Okay? So here they are slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held killed because they stood up in church and said, let me tell you about what Christ has done in my life. They told somebody on the street, let me tell you what God has done for me. So verse 10, and they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So we have, we come from a long line of people that have died for this faith. And they're waiting on us to complete our mission, our task, our beheading or our however they kill us. They're waiting on us, and then God's going to get vengeance back on the people who did it. But the bottom line is they were persecuted and they were killed for believing, having the audacity to believe that every word of God is pure. 
and I do. The Catholic Church, did they ever kill people for believing the Bible? I would say that the reason why the cardinals of the Catholic Church wear red is that's the color of the blood of the martyrs that they have slain because they refuse to bow down before the papacy, which I never will. So they were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And so there is a rest a little while for them until the fellow servants should be killed as they were killed. Now, Romans chapter 8, and there's a, several songs written that go along with this, and I love all of them. Probably some of them I haven't heard. But this is that passage that says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who? Who or what? Just because you suffered, does that mean God doesn't love you anymore? No. He does. In fact, your suffering he takes very personally. And God wrote down the names of everybody that was part of that. And God's going to turn them over and give them what they deserve. You can count on it. But see, that's something I think that goes through a lot of people's minds is, well, I'm going through this bad thing. God must be against me now. Why is God against me? What did I do? Did I do something wrong? Is it because of stuff I did 20 years ago? I'll never forget. I'll never forget. Young lady that I pastored years ago, I happened to be with her family. Her dad was undergoing a, a cardiac test, and he died on the table suddenly. And the doctor, I'll never forget, the doctor came out and said, we lost him. I'll never forget that day as long as I live. And later on, she, after thinking for a long time, she asked me, she said, you know, Brother Mike, before I came to church and started living for God, I, I did some bad things. Is God doing this to punish me for that? And I said, has God forgiven you? Yeah, I believe he has. So then he won't punish you anymore. People die. And this man especially, I knew where he was. He was in heaven. Okay, so when these bad things happen, sometimes we think that God doesn't love us anymore. But let's read this. Romans 8, verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? And the answer, there's a question on every one of these, and the answer is no. Shall distress? No. Persecution? Or famine? Or nakedness? Or peril? Or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, like scorpions and serpents, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And see, this is where it comes down to it. That day, one day, years ago, I spent on my face before God, crying, reading portion, things like this, and other places in the Bible going, God, you're, you don't lie. You said this, and God, I need you to do this. God, if you don't do this for me, I, I'm not going to make it. God, I'm in bad shape. God, I'm a, I'm a terrible mess. God, please do this for me. And God has been doing it ever since. I mean, he really taught me how to believe 
that those promises that he made were not conditioned on how good I was. They were conditioned on, will you believe me? Will you trust me? And God taught me faith and trust then. Resolve, which means to me, God, I don't care what you do as long as you do it. I don't care who, how, how my life ends as long as you're the one in charge of it. So however I'm going to leave this world and go to that one, that's up to you. Okay? And that goes against the thinking that some have had, I've had it, of not letting God take my life, if you know what I mean. I said, God, however you want to do this, do it. Now, next week, I'm going to show you some neat things from the Word of God. I haven't talked about them much. I've known them for a long time. Verses 35 through 39. There's four verses here. Well, 35, 36, 37, 38 through five verses. Five full verses, okay? Imagine that. There we are back to that number again. And that number five is going to intersect with another number in Scripture. And in both of, understanding both of those numbers and the plain text of the Scriptures, you're going to see that God does have a plan for when He takes us out of here. And it will involve persecution. Don't let that worry you. God's got it all in order. Because there's another, there's a number here. You always, you hear me tell you, if you see a list of things, count that number. Count the things in that list. Like we did, um, let's see, what verse was it? When, oh, when we were talking about Stephen. There were the Libertines, the Cyrenians, the Alexandrians, and the Cilicians, and the Asians disputing with Stephen. Why five groups? Acts is the fifth book of the New Testament. First Peter has five chapters. What, it's, what is it about? Persecution. Fiery trial, which is to try us. Okay? So there's that number, but there's another number here that's related, very, very heavily related to the day that you and I leave here, okay? See if you can count it. See if you can count it in these five verses, all right? And we'll pick up on this when we come back and finish dealing with this part next week, all right? Now, again... I'm trying to be upbeat and have a smile on my face instead of saying, they're going to kill us. It's going to be bad. Because that's how I want to do it. But maybe it won't be so bad. Maybe God will just fill us so much with Him that nothing else will matter. It's like, a form of Holy Ghost anesthesia, right? Okay? Maybe it'll be just that good. Or maybe it won't, but God will take us through it. Amen? Hope you enjoyed this. You're the reason why we do what we do. We thank you every day for being a part of our church, a part of our ministry and our lives. And the hungry people of Kenya can go to bed tonight with food in their bellies. Thanks to God and thanks to God's people. God bless you. I love you. See you next time. Bye-bye. And the number is... I'm not going to tell you. <laughs>